Hi there, I'm Matthew Lester from the Rhodes Business School. This is a short video intervention to review the UNISA tax examinations for 2011 as updated for the 2012 tax amendments. I'm looking at question 2, which is for 50 marks and 75 minutes in anticipated duration. As always, I advise students to look at the requirements of the question before even reading the question. So we go to the end of section 2 and we find that we are required to do a taxable income calculation for the 2013 year of assessment. What is quite important is to note that you must provide your opinion as well as reasons as to why items are deductible or not. You are required to round off, that is easy enough, and we are also looking in part two at doing a simple tax computation uh, for the year end of assessment where they are giving you the taxable income that you must calculate off. So you mustn't let your first part of the question affect the second part of the question. Right, let's go now and read the actual question. First of all, we're given a small business corporation that is a VAT vendor. That immediately must bring your attention to the fact that we're going to have special tax allowances and special tax rates. We are required to look at the 28 February year-end. It's a manufacturing company, which means it gets special tax allowances. We have been acquired to assist an, account an accountant, and the company has given us a net profit and the question is telling us we can assume that the net profit is calculated correctly. All amounts exclude VAT unless the question tells you otherwise. That means that the question is going to have some VAT implications. We start off with, we have dividends received from local companies. We know those are exempt. We have dividends received from foreign companies. We know that they are partially taxable, but fortunately we don't have to do any withholding tax computations. Then we have a small item relating to uniforms. That is normally a fringe benefits test. It's nothing to be frightened of. That's of course tax deductible. We have contributions to pension funds. We know that there are limits to that contained in Section 11. We're going to have to apply them. And then we have the question of SARS penalties, which we know are not deductible in terms of Section 23. There is nothing to be frightened of at this stage. Carrying on, we have a broad-based employee share plan. We know that that's Section 8 Cap B and that there will be a deduction subject to certain limits where we get a deduction equivalent to the market value less what people have paid for them subject to a maximum of 10,000 Rand per employee. We also have rental paid on the offices and we see that those are not coterminous to the year end and there will be some adjustments required there. As in many of these questions, we have a question of legal fees. When are legal fees deductible and when not? We know that we will have to visit Section 11A and Section 11C. Reading in the question there, we see that we have got a faulty computer and as a result of that there has been damage to a file server. This is an inherent risk of the business and consequently we have settled the claim that would rank for deduction. It is a normal concomitant of business. We also have attorney's fees. They are dealt with in section 11c. Two types, one relating to debts, which obviously are deductible, and one relating to employees, which is not deductible. We also have doubtful debts allowances that have to be calculated. They give you the extent of the debtor's book, and they give you the extent of the doubtful debts. Obviously, we have to concentrate on the doubtful debts. They also throw in a loan to an employee, which obviously does not qualify for the doubtful debts allowance. We have the importation of stock, foreign denominated currency. So we know that we are going to have to do a computation to capitalize the debt, bring it on board. Then we're going to have to have it arrive in Durban. That's not an implication but we are going to have to add import duties to the cost of the stock and then we are going to have exchange differences when we make a part payment and a further exchange difference at the end of the year of assessment. The exchange rates are then provided. 
We have also developed a new office building. That's very common today. We have the total costs given, including costs of transfer duty and VAT. Watch out, that can be reclaimable. We also then have a use of the floor space, which we must consider. Is it used completely for business? We also have a tenant involved that we have to consider. Is there any prorating? Can the allowances be claimed? And then we have to see that amounts were received from tenants and we have an advance payment as well, which obviously will be fully tax deductible. We then have the sale of a machine to an unconnected person. Obviously, that must immediately bring into your mind two things, the Section 8.4 recoupment and the capital gain. The fact that the purchase price might be outstanding at year end is of no consideration. Carrying on. We have a new machine that has been acquired, but then they give us a crucial piece of information. The machine was not brought into use during the year of assessment. That's a one strike and you're out position. The capital allowances will not be claimable. Then we have a further machine that has been purchased uh, where they've paid a deposit and they have financed the balance by way of a suspensive sale with a local bank. Obviously, there are going to be calculations to correct the position so that we don't land up paying, claiming the payments that we only claim the capital allowances. Notice that the cost of the machine has an inclusive VAT consideration, which must obviously be stripped down to its exclusive component before the capital allowances are claimed. Then we have that the machine was brought into use during the year of assessment, so the capital allowances can be claimed, which is different from what we the circumstances in Part 12. We have other assets as well. They will obviously be um, eligible for tax deductions. Very important there is to look at the purchase date. Remember, the, we are dealing with a small business corporation. Consequently, we will be writing these assets off using the 50, 30, 20 allowances. And so the purchase date is important to see which date of year of assessment we have brought it in. Carrying on, we are given the provisional tax payments. Obviously, they are not tax deductible, but the question says that you must state so. Otherwise, you'll lose out on some marks. The question, the item 15, is primarily used in the answering of the second part to the question in the calculation of the tax liability. So, there are your requirements. Let's get on with the question now and see what we actually can achieve. Remember, as you are seeing in the solution, it's actually a beautiful solution because it divides everything up into its components and thereby you can score marks easily. So let's see how easily we can knock up some marks here. What are we doing? Okay, we put down the net profit, that's per question, that's easy enough. Start off with dividends. When we go to dividends, we know exclude local dividends, that's half a mark money for jam. Then we get move on and we say, right, included in dividends is foreign dividends. We know they are partially taxable, so we have to take them out. Then use 10B3 and the formula of 13 over 28 to include the partially taxable portion. The question of the uniforms with the company logo, that's easy. That's an ordinary concomitant of business, it's completely deductible in terms of Section 11A. Item 3 is the limitation of the pension fund deductions. We know 11L limits the deduction to approved fu pension funds to 10% of approved remuneration. However, we also know that in practice, SARS pushes that up to 20%. We see that no limit applies, therefore the full amount is deductible. Very easy. A further easy point is then scored for identifying 23D that no tax penalties can ever be claimed, even if they were incurred in the normal course of business. So that one's an easy mark. The broad-based employee share plan, obviously the benefits taxed in terms of Section 8B, the deduction is granted in terms of Section 11I Cap A. We have 20 shares that have been issued with a market value of 1,000 Rand, but they paid 2,000 Rand. 
if we look at that, that leads to 180,000 Rand potential deduction, but the deduction may never be greater than 10,000 Rand per employee. There are only 10 employees, therefore the deduction is 100,000 Rand. The annual rent payments, notice they do not all fall within the current year of assessment and some apportionment is required. We also see that there is also the 23H appearing in this. This is where we have advance payments, but the advance payments in this case only secure a benefit that will be utilized within the first six months of the following financial year. Therefore, section 23H does not apply. The annual payments on short-term insurances, again we have to look at the year ends and see which year is we are dealing with and do some apportionment. We also have to look at the advance payment again and section 23H. 23H is in play. The benefit will be for longer than six months, but remember that section 23H does not apply if the expenditure is less than 100,000 Rand. We then carry on to the legal expenses and we see that damages are the sort of damages that are paid in the normal course of business and therefore they are deductible in terms of section 11a. Legal fees on the other hand go to section 11c and if the expense was specifically deductible in terms of section 11a then it must be a revenue expense and 11c says that legal fees relating to revenue matters are fully tax deductible. We then go on to the collection of debts, and we know that 11C allows for collection charges to be deducted, but we have to watch out that part of it relates to collection from an employee, and therefore no deduction is granted in those circumstances. It's considered capital in nature. In the doubtful debts allowance, the first trick one must always remember is to add back the amount that was claimed in the previous year. Then we calculate the current year allowance based on the doubtful debtors list amount multiplied by the 25% that is granted by SARS. We then go to no doubtful debt is granted on the employee loans because writing off an an loan to an employee is not deductible in terms of 11A or 11I. Now we come to the foreign exchange issues. This really frightens people. The real thing to take into account here is strip it out into its component parts. First of all, we have to get the 25D deduction of expenditure at the time of placing of the order. Then we, next step, add the import duties. Not too much of a brain teaser in that. The next great event is that we have partially paid some of the debt. That is where we have to go to 24i and work out the exchange difference on the portion of the debt that was repaid, i.e. the $70,000, and get the exchange difference and deduct it. We haven't finished yet because obviously the remainder of the debt, the $45,000, is still on the books at year end, therefore section 24i applies for a second time and we have to work out a second exchange difference. On to office buildings. Obviously office buildings are a capital expense. They are not deductible in terms of 11a, but of course there is a trade conducted even though we've rented out part of it. Therefore, section 13 Quinn applies, and what we have to do there is we have to say there are the costs of the building, including what they've put in there, the transfer duty, um, and claim 5% on it. I would actually say that that transfer duty is recoverable in the VAT computation. I'd leave it out, but the solution leaves it in. Then we get the allowance based at 5%. On the rent received, that's just a simple question of business of the definition of gross income that is fully taxable. And we also know that advance payments, the Delphos or Silver Glen cases then apply that advance payments are taxable even though they relate to a service that will be provided in a subsequent period. We add them to taxable income. On the selling of the machine, 
we've got to be quite careful how we lay it out. Remember, please, there are two components to this aspect of the question. Number one is the recoupment in terms of 84A. We take the tax value at zero and we recoup the selling price. That gives us the recoupment to take us back to the original cost of the asset. A lot of people stop there and they fail to consider that there is a second part to this question which says we have sold for in excess of the original base cost and therefore there is a capital gain. You can take that as being 130,000 selling price versus 110,000 the original cost or what has been covered in the recoupment calculation. We work out the capital gain of 20,000 and we set it aside because we are going to need it at the end of the computation. We also make a little mark in there to say that the fact that there is an outstanding debt relating to a capital item is of no consequence in a taxation computation. On the purchase of the new machine, we see there is potentially a new allowance there under 12E. 100% write-off of manufacturing asset in the year that it is brought into use. But the question tells us it wasn't brought into use until 10 days after the year of end of the year of assessment and therefore they lose out. They will have to claim it in the subsequent year of assessment. The purchase of the new machine, there we have the 100% allowance. But remember, they've put a little trick in there. They said the total cost was 364800 including VAT. So you have to strip the VAT out to bring it back to 320000 And then you will add the 22,000 Rand foundation structure that is also given to you in the question. And that will give you a total allowance of 342000 Not too bad there. Then we have the interest on the suspense of sale agreement. They are telling us that the interest is not incurred in the production of the income as it is not a new trade, uh, and therefore not deductible. The delivery vehicle, notice we are in the second year of use of that, so we get only get a 30% allowance. The computers are in their first year of use not as a manufacturing asset, therefore we get a 50% allowance. Provisional tax payments are not deductible, you need to say so to collect the mark, don't just leave it out. And then we have to include the capital gain that we calculated earlier, remembering that the inclusion rate for a company is 66,66% and that will give you taxable income. Part 1 to this question is actually quite easy. If you look at the solution, the beauty is in the simplicity of its presentation. As we go through it item by item, we are scoring marks all the way. And thus, if you do come across a problem, it's not going to hurt the overall result too much. In the second part, we have to do a taxation calculation. We are told at the outset of this question that it is a small business corporation or SBC. We are not required to go through all the tests as to whether it is an SBC. Is all that we are to asked to do is to pick up the taxable income of 375000 and apply the progressive rate of tax that is applied to SBCs to calculate the taxation liability. So we go 375000 less 350000 that's the top, the level at which the 28% kicks in for companies. So that leaves you with 25,000 times 28% plus the tax on the first 350,000 being 20,051 and that gives you 27,051. Then for a mark each, very easy, deduct the first and the second provisional tax payments to give you your normal tax liability. The question that we have been looking at is very simple. We should have been... The question that we have been looking at is very simple. Please concentrate on how you present your answers so that the marks can be scored easily and that the examiner doesn't have to go looking all over pages and pages of information to see whether you've got the basic idea. I'm Matthew Lester from the Rhodes Business School.